there it is. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And I was amazed. I wasn't expecting a. Okay, I wasn't expecting a presentation about stories because this is the first time I'm doing a presentation about stories. It's <laughs> always so, so the same thing. The ecology, this and that, the destruction of the worlds, and how pearls are going to save everyone. And they said, no, let's do stories this time. So I also have a couple of stories that maybe Matt hasn't heard. But they're all local. The re one of the reasons why I chose stories for this occasion is that uh, I live in Mexico, and I lived in a place where pearls were were traditional, and we had a pearl fishery there. So you walk down the streets, and you would find people that said, oh yeah, look, this corner, this is where this happened, and it had to do with a pearl. And you go like, oh, really? Yeah, this place, the, the, dr the drunken Yaki Indian had this pearl this big, and he sold it for a gringo, for a bottle of tequila, right here! And you go like, really? So the stories, even if they come from 100, 200 years ago, they're alive. Uh -huh. People still tell them, and with emotion. So I said, yeah, let's do it. So this is a story. And by the way, most of the images are created with artificial intelligence. We couldn't find images, of course, for many things. But this is a story of, uh, from the town where I uh, used to live for 30 years, Guaymas. Uh -huh. So it's from the uh, early uh, 1800s. And this story was told to me by uh, Madame Marie Ricot. Uh -huh. So there were a lot of French people arriving in Guaymas, and Germans, and Scots, and all sorts of uh, European immigrants. And uh, she had the best shell collection in Guaymas. And she owned pearls, I mean jars with pearls, mm -hmm. from the old times of the old fishers. So when I started doing research on pearls, I sat down with her and I asked her, tell me everything you, you, you can recall about pearls. And she told me this story, which I've never told to anyone before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the story is about a young man by the name of Juan. Uh, I didn't put Jesus because you know, it's everyone in Mexico is called Jesus. The second most traditional name is Juan. I decided for John. So this guy, he's a poor man, uh, mixed ancestry, Spanish and, and Yaqui, and he was in love with Pupe. Uh -huh. This is a gorgeous girl from the French population in Guaymas, and she loved pearls, but she kind of loved them more than anything. <laughs> So, Juan kept asking Pupé to become his uh, girlfriend. And she said, you know what? Uh, I'm not a, a woman for a single man. And what I do is I, I need a lot of pearls. <laughs> so if you want my love, I can give you love for one night, one girl. <laughs> but it has to be the perfect pearl. It has to be big, round, and uh, perfect. Okay, so Juan says, well, I'm a fisherman. What am I supposed to do? Fish. <laughs> so every day he goes into the water, brings up oysters, kills them, nothing. Or maybe just a tiny little one that doesn't really uh, suit up for a poupe. So he keeps trying and he would see Pupé on the streets, walking with another guy, and he knew the guy had a pearl. And he didn't have the pearl. So he was a very unlucky guy. And one night he says, I'm going to strike a deal. Uh -huh. And he said, God or Satan, assist me. I mean, I'm, this is really important. It's Pupé. And an angel and, and a demon show up at the same time, like, boom, okay, let's try a deal, okay? And he said, if any of you can get me the love of Pupé, uh -huh, I will be forever in your debt, and you can have my soul. <laughs> so they said, okay. Next morning, he goes like, ah, okay, 
it was a dream, whatever. He goes swimming and he's diving and he finds this pearl. And the pearl, well, the, the pearl oyster, and the pearl oyster was gaping open and he could see sparks coming up. So he said, it's a pearl. Of course, in, in, nature, in real life, this doesn't happen. <laughs> but anyway, this is this the story. So he grabs a pearl oyster and brings it up and he says, oh, the pearl, finally. He opens it up. And there were two pearls. Both were perfectly round, 12 millimeters, which was fantastic. Amazing luster, amazing overtones. One black, one white. So you can imagine that it was the demon and the angel sending their own pearls and saying like, hey, we struck a deal, okay? So they both kept their end of the bargain. So he's really happy and he decides to find the pupe and, and tells her, look, I have these two amazing pearls and you can leave every other man on the planet just for me. <laughs> and she goes like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> I'm not done yet uh -huh. because I haven't finished the strand. <laughs> so I want to have this beautiful strand just like the, form, the, lady of, uh, the first lady of Mexico. All around my beautiful neck. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, he says, "Oh God, I think she doesn't really love me." Trying <laughs> 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 to think, she doesn't love me. <laughs> so I can have an, a very pleasant night of pleasure with her. What pearl do I give her? Do I give her any pearl at all? The black, the white. Time to choose. So he finally makes his move. But before giving her any pearl, he gives her one last chance. My eternal love and the pearls, of course, and you can keep the previous ones, but just come with me. And she said, no, one pearl, one night of pleasure. He chooses wisely. Uh -huh. He gets his one night. He goes off, he's very happy, and finally realizes that she will never love him, and he doesn't really love her. <laughs> so th that's all he needed. Really. So, Pupé has the pearl that Juan has given him, her, and he puts it inside her box with all the other pearls, and she goes like, oh, beautiful pearl, stores it, puts it away, and let's say a week later, or some days later, she met, meets another guy with another pearl to add to the collection, so she goes back, with this new pearl, then <laughs> <laughs> a scream that everyone in line was across the little town. We were like, ah, this is what's happening. <laughs> she opens the jewelry box, uh -huh, and she finds the black pearl, because one gave her the black one. <laughs> and all the other pearls, the white ones, were dead and lifeless, chalky. And the black pearl was Glowing of <laughs> like big cannibalizing or vampirizing the rest of the <laughs> So, and, and it, the black girl was really happy. <laughs> and she became mad. <laughs> and Juan lived happily ever after. <laughs> the other story. I was once in La Paz and I was looking for the uh, traditional pearl diving places where they would get the pearls. I went over to this place and I, I was told, this is Punta El Mechudo. Uh -huh. Mechudo? Mechudo means mop. And I was going like, what? They were doing something with mops or the witches here don't have rooms, they used to have mops. What? What's the deal? Oh, no, no. There was this guy, a Yaqui Indian. And you know, Yaqui Indians were supposed to be the ones that uh, were the motor behind the pearl industry in Mexico, at least in the Sea of Cortez. So this guy had a huge mane of hair. That's why he was called a Mechu. So this is a Yaqui Indian, uh, typical. So uh, they were so amazingly hardy. The Yaqui still exist, of course, but they're, they become modernized like everyone else. They could dive down to 20 meters, 60 feet, um, stay underwater for five minutes, 
and they were great to defy the sharks, manta rays and other creatures that would attack them, usually armed with just a stick, basically a pencil. Because the the owners of the Pearl Armadas would not give them knives or anything else because the Yakis would turn against them and kill them. So, and uh, there was this saying among, amongst the pearl fishermen, this, you don't have any Yaki Indians, you don't have any pearls. So no Yaki, no pearl, forget it. So El Mechudo was uh, the best uh, pearl diver. So this is a fishing armada. This is from Guaymas, actually. So you would have one sailboat, a lugger, and several small pangas, or boats. Each of the pangas would at least have four people. And they would reach a site, the pangas would spread out, fan out, and then they would start diving. They would uh, have a rock as a weight that they would use to go down into the bottom, fast, a little catch bag so they would place the oysters inside. They would only fish during the summer months because in winter it was really cold. And they would usually work four hours in the morning and then after lunch in the afternoon for another two to four hours depending on, the, on their climate. Now in those days it was traditional to get the tenth pearl so you were harvesting pearls, and you have pearl number one, pearl number two, number three. Number 10 goes to the Virgin. So each uh, location would have a little shrine with a Virgin. Uh -huh. This was highly promoted by the church, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the most famous of all these uh, Virgins was the Virgin of uh, uh, Loreto, the mission of Loreto in Baja, California. Mm -hmm. So. This virgin in particular had this mantle on top of her and the, every one of those tent pearls was brought over, drilled, and then attached with thread to the mantle. It was said that once the mantle was really heavy and about to topple the, the virgin, uh, it was rolled up, the pearls were removed, and then sent to the Pope. <laughs> it was fashionable, you know, for that reason. So every time uh, the Yaquis were out fishing, they knew they needed that tenth pearl because it was it offered protection. So El Mechudo again, he was the best pearl diver of his generation. He would catch more pearl oysters than any other diver. And this long and thick mane of black hair gave him a, a very unusual appearance. He tied his hair in a knot so it would fall down around him and like a hat would protect him from uh, the sun. So one day, the story goes that the catch was really bad, the weather was getting worse, and Machudo was not meeting his quota. I mean, there were other guys winning. And he was going like, oh my god, I'm the best, I'm not Machudo. <laughs> An ego thing, of course. So the captain, the Armada says, okay guys, let's go, too windy, can't see a thing, and uh, it's gonna get choppy, let's go back. He says, nope, not going back. I, I'm still going to die. And they, they told him, Mechudo, we have the 10th pearl. So that day in particular, they had already met the quota of 10 pearls. So they would have one for the virgin. They said, no, I'm not diving for the pearl, for the virgin. I'm diving for Satan's pearl, for the, for the devil's pearl. He was really angry. And he dives in the water and he doesn't come back. Yeah, they told him, let's go, he did it. So what happened to the poor Mishudo? Of course, he drowned. So a week later, they come back into the area and they're diving again. And one of the divers, one of the other Yaquis comes up and says, I found him, Mishudo's here. So they found him dead, drowned of course, and his long mare, uh, mane of hair got tangled in a huge fan coral full of pearl oysters. So, and he didn't find the devil's uh, pearl, of course. The thing is that afterwards, the pearl divers in that area would drown, constantly drown, for very stupid reasons. Uh -huh. 
And, it, and everyone said, this place is cursed. There was a year that I was in La Paz and someone said, you know, the, the, the thing with El Machuro is that it's also affecting other things. Like what? A plane crash right there where the, the waters are in, in, in Punta El Machuro. So this is the place. It still exists, and he might have died right around there. That's a punta point. So people in the hospital talk about this. <laughs> this other story is about the first millionaire in California. Of course, California in those days looked dramatically different. It was New Spain. It wasn't even Mexico nor the United States. Uh, and uh, there was uh, this mission, the mission of San Ignacio in uh, Baja California. And they, the, oh, this is the Virgin of Loreto, by the way, okay, because I didn't find one about uh, with the other uh, Virgin in uh, San Ignacio. But the Spaniards were there. And there was this Spanish soldier by the name of Manuel de Ocio. Okay, he was stationed there in this submission, 1739, the year of our Lord. And he was looking at the divers. He, he never had any experience in pearls or anything like that. He was just stationed there, bored to tears, I can imagine myself. <laughs> and in 1740, something really weird happened. In Mexico, we call it Mar de Fondo. Somehow, the water from the bottom, you have these very strong currents with kind of like upwellings and they throw things from the bottom of the ocean. Even large rocks can be thrown into the beach. So thousands, if not millions, of pearl oysters laid on the beach. And one of the natives ran into the mission and said, come and see this. So Manuel de Ocio goes there and he sees all those pearl oysters. And he starts opening up a few and <laughs> there's a pearl. He opens up another one, there's a pearl. <laughs> But he was a soldier, and he was prohibited from going into the pearl business. So he discerned. <laughs> so that was a change of the job, and he said, "I'm going to become a pearl uh, entrepreneur, a pearler." So that was his vision. He wanted to build a fishing armada. Of course, he didn't have anything; just a couple of pearls that he found. And he didn't know about pearls. So he started diving with the natives and looking at the pearl beds and trying to understand how they worked. And he came up with this invention. Before his invention, you would basically have just a new diver going down into the bottom with a rock to get there the faster, a catch bag, and they would individually cut off the pearl oysters, put them in the catch bag. And Manuel de Ocio, found the rainbow lip pearl oyster, the Peria sterna, which instead of attaching lonely, forms what are known in Mexico as macoyos. So basically these are gigantic carpets where the pearl oysters are attached to each other. And he said, hey, you can dive down and you can grab a bunch, and you can grab, let's say, a hundred, at one this, uh, movement, with just one movement. He said, what if we do something different? And the other thing he, he also imagined is, why am I going to open up the, the shelves? It's difficult. You know, have, have any here, anyone here opened up pearl oysters? How many cuts do you have in your hand afterwards? <laughs> yeah, the shell itself is incredibly sharp. And the rainbow lips have spines. I mean, they can become embedded in your fingers. In between the finger and the nail, that hurts. So he said, I'm not going to do that. So he just left the oysters to rot on the beach. So this is, I was doing this at 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so this would be the representation of a macoyo. So he would send divers down, attach hooks to the bottom, and these hooks had ropes all the way up, and with a machete, they would kind of like cut portions. Like this is what, the, it's a canoe sized. So they would just grab enough to fill the entire canoe. Uh -huh. And then they would hoist these up, put them here on the boat, and of course the boat would start kind of like sinking, 
they would go back to the beach as fast as possible and then just throw them there on the beach for weeks and they would rot and it was so easy just to go grab them, the shell open with the rotting animal and the pearls were just gleaming there it was so easy to find them and if you wanted the really tiny ones you would put them in buckets with water salt water and just run a sieve just like a centrifuge and then filter them so he obtained every single grain of pearls he was so amazingly successful he became a, a millionaire in less than a year and he was exporting his pearls all over the, the Europe and after seven years he became even wealthier uh, he became a cattle rancher a mining uh, he owned mines he obtained a fishing license that allowed him only him to fish pearl oysters in this entire area in the Sea of Cortez no one else he could pay for that so he had absolutely no competition a monopoly and the, the gold mine and silver mine he owned still exists. It's uh, uh, beautiful. But of course, he attracted the attention of unwanted <laughs> individuals, the robbers. Yay. So one night, they show up at his ranch, uh -huh, and they steal from him whatever he had. And they knew he had a lot of pearls. He was said to have these huge ceramic or pot uh, clay, uh, clay uh, jars lined with a leather that had been oiled to protect the pearls and then he would just dig holes himself and put them all over his property i mean i'm going to show you a map of his property so you can see how difficult it would have been to find them and so they started looking for the pearls and even today there's still people if you go over to el triunfo which is a, a touristic town now and you may find someone you can't use a metal detector, as you can imagine. You need a pearl detector. There it went, and looking for the pearl uh, cachet. So this green area was his ranch. Here is El Triunfo, right there. And it's just desert full of rocks and shrubs, so it's like, have fun. <laughs> Now this is the final story, and these previous stories are about things I've never experienced. That you you kind of like are immersed in the area, you hear them. But this one, this is something that happened to me. It's not part of the story. It's the story of the Virgin of La Soledad, Virgen de la Soledad, the Virgin of Solitude from Oaxaca. Okay. So the first miracle this virgin ever performed was uh, she was being sent from Mexico City to the city of Oaxaca. Oaxaca has like a hundred temples. And uh, she was going to be delivered in a monastery so she could uh, adorn the place. And the thing is that she was being drawn in a um, cart with a donkey. And suddenly the donkey says, no more. I don't want to budge. No move. No me muevo. And they start beating the monkey, the donkey. And he says, no, not moving. They start beating the donkey. Donkey dies. Miracle. Why? I don't, I don't get it. And the thing is that, the, no, what happened next is this. They said, okay, let's get the virgin and put her, it, and put her in another cart with another donkey and they couldn't move the bloody virgin. She had gained weight. Uh -huh. So what the people said is, you know what, this this is very logical, you know what, but she doesn't want to be moved. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. So that means she wants to stay here. So they built a temple around her <laughs> in that side. By the way, there's a big rock right there and that's where the donkey died. Uh -huh. Then they, people still go and, and give the gifts to the, to the donkey because he, he had the first idea, I guess. So this, you can buy things like this. This is the virgin. And here you can see the little donkey, you see? So this happened in December 18, 18, 1620, okay? Now, in many places in Europe and in Mexico, the, the virgins 
we're just given normal, regular clothes, but you know, they're the the mother of God, and they deserve to be you know, outfitted accordingly. You know? So the people of Oaxaca decided to start giving her a full gown, a crown, and everything. I mean, made of gemstones and gold and pearls, of course. And uh, this is the way it looked uh, some time ago. Well, this is uh, the 20th century, sorry. Uh, it was stolen mm -hmm. in the 1800s. Anyway, in 1909, they decided to redo the whole thing to the exact specifications. Mm -hmm. So they did the entire thing. This is a, a flower, an alcatraz flower. It has a little natural pearls there. It's made out of solid gold. And I mean, everything is like lavish. And on her forehead, she had one large natural pearl that came from La Paz, from the Sea of Cortez. Uh, the crown, is, as you can see there, it's two kilos of gold, just a crown, okay? 600 diamonds. I mean, there were easier to obtain the diamonds than the pearls. In January 10th of 1991, guess what happened? The robbers, once again, going to the cathedral and strip the virgin naked. So, they take everything. And the patronato of the church decides in 2000 to recover the dignity of the, the queen of, uh, of the patron saint of uh, Oaxaca. So they say, okay, we have the original uh, design. We know exactly how much it takes in gold, diamonds, emeralds. Uh, the emeralds came from uh, Colombia. We'll source them from Colombia. We want everything the way it was. And at, at the very end, they said, okay, what about the pearl? We need a white natural pearl mm -hmm. from the Sea of Cortez. Mm -hmm. So, 14 millimeters, per perfectly round, white colored pearl. And in 2008, the people from the Patronato make a phone call to a small pearl farm in the Sea of Cortez. <laughs> and they said, we need a pearl. Natural pearl from the Sea of Cortez, these traits. And we told them, well, we don't have natural pearls. We grow culture pearls. So, no, but we have friends that sell natural pearls. Let's see if we can find one for you guys. And no, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Enrique gets a call from Oaxaca. Uh -huh. We have a conclave meeting. Uh -huh. And Enrique says, okay, these guys. They need a white 14 millimeter natural pearl from the Sea of Cortez. Okay, this this is exactly what I told you. On a second call, when we told them we don't we couldn't find one, they said, "Okay, let's make it a culture pearl." And it's an impossible pearl. Why? Because our uh, average pearl size is nine millimeters. In those days, the, some of the largest pearls were, were just barely 12 millimeters. Not only that, I mean, our pearls are dark, rainbowy colored pearls, rarely white. When you find, we do find pearl oysters with white nacre, but if you have a blue one, yeah, you say, there are enough white pearls in the world, then let's go after the blue. Uh -huh. So we select the donor, from the mat, the mantle donor with the blue uh, traits, not the white one. So very rare to get white uh, pearls. And most of the large pearls were Baroque, not round. So basically impossible. And Don Miguel, the guy from Oaxaca says, uh, the Virgin just told me, and he, he's, he was in the church, probably with the Virgin herself right there. And she was very like, tell them. <laughs> Please look for this pearl. So Manuel, one of my former associates, walks out of there going like, ah, it's impossible, we want to find the pearl. 30 minutes later, he was looking at all the pearls above 10 millimeters in diameter, and he comes back and, no oh, pearl, no oh, pearl, I found this one, and this one, they're all baroque, they're uh, the dark gray, that's it. So, third phone call, Don Miguel said, 
uh, if we told Don Miguel, no, impossible to find this pearl like we told you, but we can send you a Baroque pearl. Wouldn't, wouldn't you like Baroque, you have a millimeter pearl, we have one. He, Don Miguel says, no, no, you know. The Virgin says, look harder. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mother is angry. At that moment, she's going, yeah, just, 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 I'm wasting my time and everything. And Enrique goes and says, you know what, my mom? Look at t this year's stash. We haven't separated those pearls. We haven't graded them. So there might be one there. So Manuel goes. And he comes back three minutes later with his eyes this big. And he goes. You can't see a thing. And we looked at it and go like, Whoop. It was inside a little plastic bag individually because it was a 14 millimeter round light colored pearl uh, it was lighter than what you see here the, the photo is not that uh, it wasn't that dark uh -huh. and uh, it said in a little piece of written paper Douglas December 18 2006 mm -hmm. so I see that I operated on that oyster on December 18th of 2006 and that produced that pearl okay that's so, fine. <laughs> so the fourth call, Enrique is the one that calls Don Miguel from Oaxaca. And Don Miguel, <laughs> and, yes, yeah, you found it, yeah? And Enrique's going like, <laughs> and he says, oh, the, the, the virgin told me this would happen. So it's just a matter of fact. Right? No, how much do you want for the pearl? And we were speechless because this was one of the largest round pearls from the Sea of Cortez ever produced. And it had a value that we couldn't even fathom at that moment. I mean, it wasn't a million dollars or anything like that, but it was probably the most pricey Cortez pearl ever produced as a culture of the pearl. And we told them, we'll tell you later. So we, again, we had a conclave. We, we, decided to give the pearl away. Just told me, have this pearl because it's for something good. It's for our heritage as a nation. It's a gift. And he said, yeah, the virgin told me you, you were a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't charge anything. But you know what? She will pay you three times more than what that pearl is worth. And we said, yeah, sure, whatever. We sent the pearl. And here is, uh, oh. this is Don Miguel with the, with the priest. Uh -huh. This is the, these are all uh, pearls from, uh, from our farm as well, but smaller, of course, with the large uh, golden alcatraz. But this is how the pearl on the forehead ended up looking like. Mm -hmm. It looks darker. Again, bad photos. We had bad cameras in those days. And here you can see how they're making the headpiece. This goes before, this is the original one, and this was the new one, made with the emeralds and everything, and the pearl. All handmade. So, this is, uh, I took this photo, she's behind now at the last pane. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's security lasers and people, that, snipers. So this is as close as I could get a couple of years ago when I visited Oaxaca. I went to see her and say, yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, because the next year, it was payback. Remember, the, the Miguel said, oh, she'll repay you. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. So December 18th, 2009, okay? Enrique and I, Manuel was not there because he was away on vacation. And we were seeing oysters just in the cold in the lab and suddenly when Enrique makes us a weird squeaking noise something like ah! <laughs> and I went like what happened and he goes like ah! Enrique what's happening are you dying or something ah! he turns to me and goes like ah! and I stand up and I go and look inside the other ah! <laughs> there was this 14 millimeter Perfectly round black pearl. Oh, wow. Natural, 
Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I had a, a photo of the pearl. I didn't finish the presentation as I wanted. It was an amazing pearl. We sold it for like $20,000. Yeah. Uh -huh. wow. So yeah, we were repaid. And guess what happened? 2010. Again. Again. December 18th. Uh -huh. And we found the pearl in that occasion. It was me that found the pearl. It was a perfectly round, 14 millimeter white pearl. Uh -huh. It wasn't as pretty as the previous one. And the last year, 2010, another pearl, another natural pearl. And that was the last. After that, we were not giving any more pearls. Uh -huh. But the date, I mean, remember that the pearl I seeded uh -huh. on December 18th uh -huh. and every December 18th we were given a pearl that's the day of the lady of solitude James that's weird and I'm not a believer at least not in the church thank you everyone